Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, also, good morning for Amish in the UK and uh, David in Mexico City. Uh, I'm Namrata Kapoor. I'm your chair for today's session on planning and urban imaginations. Um, we have a great lineup of papers today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to ask the audience to uh, wait till the end of the presentations and in the meanwhile, just put down your questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, we shall get to them uh, after the presentations end. We have about 15, 20 minutes at the end for discussion and we shall use that for your questions. Um, we have four papers today for this uh, panel. Um, we'll start with uh, Anil Kumar Roy and Krishti Verma's paper um, on the role of green spaces in health and well-being in Jaipur, implications on planning. Um, we shall then move on to uh, David Lopez Garcia from the New School. Uh, his paper is on spatial distribution of public and common mobility resources in Mexico Valley metropolitan zone. Uh, after that, we have Gargi, Mishra, and Rutul, uh, who shall present um, their paper on ecological perspectives and spatial planning, critical review of master plans for Delhi. And at the end, we have uh, Amish uh, Sarpoddar, who is from the University of Manchester, and he shall present his paper on Missing in Action in Search of an Integral and Pragmatic Planning Information Framework in India. So without much further ado, uh, I'd like to request uh, uh, Anil Kumar and Krishti Varma to begin. And um, yeah, and you guys can put your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you, Namrata. Christy, I hope you are ready. And good afternoon, good morning, even good night for David somewhere in the middle of the night. That's a geography is now shrunk with this, uh, you know, online thing. So yeah, day and night does not matter. I, I'm going to set the background for our paper uh, and, and rest of the things will be dealt with by my colleague, uh, Christy. So what we decided, it is a in-house uh, uh, research support at SEPT University. We, we call it uh, directed research projects. And then the student take up these projects as part of their uh, larger research uh, thesis. And uh, therefore, we decided to bring in uh, this particular context of uh, uh, public health uh, related to green spaces, you know. Uh, green spaces and open spaces may not be same, but somehow the, the advantage of urban greens are much more larger than the green space, so to say, in that planning and design connotations. It provides services of various kinds that we are going to examine, whether it is uh, well-being services or whether it is social services that it, it provides to us, and lots of you know, uh, well-being opportunities that it provides beyond that open uh, space or open access to the urban spaces in the uh, urban context. So uh, basically, it's, it's a very uh, um, short study, I would say, rather. Uh, we, have, we, we are going to uh, assess uh, the first part of the study is to assess the, the availability or the total uh, uh, quantum of uh, urban greens in Jaipur, semi-arid metropolitan cities in India whether it is an adequate uh, scenario, inadequate scenario, as per the various uh, norms and standards are concerned. If not, where, what is the distributional dimension where it is concentrated, where it is not at all? So those are the distributional dimensions. That's the first objective of this paper. Second objective, uh, Christy will elaborate, is to, we went to the users group and then uh, did a, a survey on the spot. Uh, uh, Christy will uh, examine that methodology also and tell how we have done that. And then got their perspective of uh, various benefits and the challenges and opportunity that these urban green spaces provides uh, at, at various scale of the planning, which is very important. We, we did survey at the neighborhood level, urban uh, open green spaces, which is neighborhood uh, gardens, parks, uh, and then journal level also to understand the scale variations and how it differs, you know, whether there's, there's a the different uh, kind of use and the different groups are using it. And then the city level, which is much more larger level and, and, and who are the people who access those city level and for how long and what are those benefits. So, so three scalar uh, 
uh, opportunity to bring in the dimension of urban spaces. But one thread is that this is going to establish that there are many benefits of urban green spaces in, in city life, particularly relevant uh, currently as COVID. We have not attempted to answer these COVID things. We stopped there. It is, we did this study before the COVID, so we'll not stretch upon that. So I think I stop here and, and request Christy to run through the, uh, the, the, the study and, and finish it in time, if at all possible. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, over to Christy now. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And hello, everyone. So uh, the topic of this research is role of urban green spaces in health and well-being in Jaipur and its implications for urban planning. So the outline of the presentation is divided into three chapters. The first is background and framework and results and major findings. So let's talk a little about background. So with a growing number of people living in cities and urban centers in India, it becomes important that the benefits of urbanization are shared equally between various population subgroups of the society in space and in time. One of these benefits to public health is urban green spaces. In a book published in 1989, uh, Kaplan's introduced uh, the attention restoration theory, uh, which suggests that the focus, concentration, and attention can be improved by spending time in or looking at nature. This was supported by many other researches, and therefore it gives us a, com a concept of well being. So, what is well being? Well being is a state of being happy, healthy, and prosperous. As for the definitions of urban green space, the definition of urban green space in India is different as per different guidelines and reports that are given. Uh, the one that we will follow is specific to the state of Rajasthan, that is urban green spaces is a comprehensive term which includes all urban parks, gardens, playgrounds, forests and related vegetation that adds value to the residents of an urban area. Now, what are these values? So there are four values to an urban green space for quality of life. First is economic, then environmental values, health values, and social values. And all of these values contribute to the sustainability of the city. In this research, we are going to focus only on health and social values. These values are reflected in some of the most famous parks of the world. For example, uh, Central Park, New York, and Hyde Park, London and the cities with very high per capita availability of, of green space, that is Stockholm and Netherlands. Our aim for this research is to assess the impacts of urban green spaces on quality of life of the residents of Jaipur city. Objectives are twofold. The first one is to assess the spatial distribution of urban green spaces, and the second is to study the social and health benefits of urban green spaces to users at city, zonal, and neighborhood level. The first objective is accomplished by carrying two tasks. The first one is to uh, was to spatially analyze Jaipur through green space distribution indicators. So there are four indicators. Percentage of uh, urban green space area, its availability, its density, and its mean area. And finally, we come on to benchmarking with the standards. Upon combining all of these parameters together, we come on to selection for sites. There were five sites selected, three at neighborhood, one at zonal, and one at city level. The second objective was accomplished by, first of all, marking the physical qualities and determinants of urban green space and the manner in which users interact with them. And then we came on to the user survey that assessed the demography, it examined the uh, accessibility, and it studied the user's perception. The sample size was 141, 44 at city, 41 at zonal, and 56 at neighborhood level. All of these samples were selected by random sampling, and the surveys were done in morning, midday, and evening to omit ambiguity. The survey questionnaire was divided into specifically five parts, demography, accessibility. There were questions about mental health, physical health, and social health, so that we can have a more nuanced version. So now let's come on to directly the spatial distribution of green spaces in Jaipur. It is stated in the Master Development Plan 2025 of the city that it currently is, the urban green spaces are short by 6.6 .6 meters square per person to meet the minimum requirement of nine meters square uh -huh. by WHO. For that, it was important for us to mark the, uh, and measure the adequacies, which was possible to 
through these four indicators that were mentioned earlier. All of these four indicators were then shown and mapped uh, together. And it is shown in the figures and maps that uh, are there on your screen. These maps show that the overall green spaces in Jaipur are small and disintegrated. There is fragmentation that suggests that there is low accessibility of urban green space in most parts of Jaipur. Upon combining all of these maps together, we selected five sites, Central Park at city level, Jawaharlal at zonal level, and then three neighborhood parks, which were also selected on the basis of how are these parks planned and executed by various development authorities and organizations. So the data indicated that the center and south have densely distributed urban green space than other areas. And the extreme east and west, they needed vigilance. Study infers that the percentage area in Jaipur of urban green space is comparatively low and the distribution is uh, uneven. Therefore, we further uh, marked the wards at all three levels, uh, which had green spaces and which did not. Some recommendations were made. First one was that there is alternative greening definitely required, especially at local level. Second was that it Jaipur needed uh, an integrated urban green space system, especially to be incorporated in the master development plan. We suggested that new research was needed to find alternate, alternative space at city level. There were some reserved lands, which if implemented, uh, could be the benefit implemented at, as urban green space could be beneficial to the society. We come on to the second aspect of this research that is the well-being aspect that means the user's survey. So as I said before, there were 141 total surveys at city zonal and neighborhood level. And all of these surveys were then sorted on the basis of gender, age, and time of visit. And then these values and graphs were found out. Uh, so the distance traveled uh, by maximum visitors at city and zonal level was the same. It was preferred as one to five kilometers. But at, uh, at neighborhood level, the distance traveled was preferred to be less than 500 meters, obviously because of the accessibility aspect. In total, 89% women and 81% men travel less than five kilometers to access urban green spaces in Jaipur. The mode of transport preferred were uh, was mostly private motorized transit at city and zonal level and at neighborhood level it was walk and nmc the people's perception was divided into four uh, categories first is physical health then leisure then environmental benefits and social health benefits and values for uh, all of these benefits uh, as per genders were identified at city zonal and neighborhood level as you can see, uh, maximum people prefer to visit urban green spaces for exercising purpose. A few of them, 43% women, 21% men, visit for leisure. Even a fewer visit for environmental benefits, but still this means that they are aware. 46% women and 30% men, they visit for social purpose. The frequency of visit, uh, which is preferred in Jaipur, is up to seven times a week. So this means that people visit urban green spaces frequently and the most frequent uh, they visit at neighborhood level. In total, 70% women, 86% men, they visit up to seven days a week. And this frequency is more at neighborhood level than at city and zonal level. The duration of stay that is preferred is 30 minutes to uh, two hours. And as you can see on your screen that 100% of females and 100% of males, they at neighborhood level, they prefer spending time in urban green spaces, this much time. The company of visitors, 75% uh, women and 65% men, they prefer visiting these urban green spaces with friends and family. At neighborhood level, this percentage is comparatively less, which means they prefer visiting alone. And that is directly related to the safety uh, perception uh, of all three levels. So the safety perception. We mapped the safety uh, according to the age groups as well as the gender groups. And it was found that 20% more women than men feel that urban green spaces in Jaipur are safe, which is a very positive aspect of uh, the city. To sum up, 78% of women and 81% men gave the rating of more than four out of five to the urban green spaces of Jaipur, which 
is quite a satisf satisfactory number. To conclude, it was found out that 82% of people said that Jaipur needed more urban green spaces. And when asked the reason, 39% of them said that they needed urban green spaces for public health, which is what we have been saying all along. 40% of the people said that no change is required. They were very satisfied with all the services and facilities which are, pro which are provided in the green spaces. 60% said that there are some improvements needed. And this graph shows uh, the improvements which the people of uh, Jaipur city suggested. Upon combining all the parameters together, a matrix was made to show the relationship between qualities of urban green spaces and gender at city, zonal and neighborhood level. Uh, the green color means that the facility is absolutely adequate and the red color means that the facility is absolutely inadequate. So as we can see from this table that city at city level and at zonal level, uh, all the almost all the facilities are available and well maintained, except apart from a uh, water drinking water water facilities and barrier free uh, features. However, at neighborhood level, there are many facilities that need vigilance. So with this, we conclude our research. Thanks yeah. a lot. Right on time, Christy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, uh, David, you're up next. So, Christy, if you can stop uh, sharing your screen yeah. and then David can go off to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Thank you for having me in the conference. Um, what I'm going to present today is a chapter of my doctoral dissertation at the New School that I am preparing for publication. The title of the paper is The Spatial Distribution of Public and Common Mobility Resources in Mexico Valley Metropolitan Zone. Um, the research problem is that, um, you know, infrastructure is the means through which a society produces their wealth, but at the same time is the most visible fruit of our collective, collective labor, right? But the problem is, as pointed out by several scholars like Morris and Brown, the problem is that um, while everyone participates in the creation of, of the urban wealth, um, investment of this wealth, um, it's not usually distributed in an equitable way, right? Um, it might be the case that uh, some places are more able to attract uh, investment of wealth and, and others will be uh, lagging, will be lagging, right? So this is exactly what I'm trying to measure in this, uh, in this paper. The distribution of wealth in the form of mobility resources um, and to do so, I'm developing this, this methodology that I'm, that I'm uh, putting at work in this paper. And, and this methodology also constitutes um, uh, um, a contribution to the literature on mobility resources. So there's a literature on mobility resources that, um, well, studies the resources available for populations to move across the city, right? But in this literature, um, scholars usually usually study the private mobility resources or mobility resources that are privately owned by people, right? So there's an, there's, a, there, there's an acknowledgement in this literature that the private and public nature of mobility resources is understudied, like uh, Lauder and Axhausen have put forward. Um, so this is a contribution that I'm trying to do with this, um, with this paper bringing nuances to further study the public and private nature of mobility resources. And also, um, I'm trying to engage with the literature on the urban commons, right? So this literature on urban commons uh, has two strands of work. One of them has to do with infrastructure management, uh, the provision of public goods and the provision of common pool resources in cities. But the other strand in, in this literature of urban commons has to do with the politics of commoning or 
how uh, communities engage politically to advance uh, the production of urban commons in cities, right? And only recently, um, there have been attempts in the literature to theorize uh, what scholars are, coming, are, are calling common, in, common in mobility. Um, so there's, there's increasingly uh, a discussion about how mobility resources have to be a common, a com an urban common. And, um, and this is also a discussion that I'm trying to, to, to participate in. So these are the research questions. Um, to what extent does the spatial distribution of common and public mobility resources and I will explain in a minute what I mean by common and public mobility resources, overlap with existing employment centers in, in Mexico Valley Metropolitan Zone. And which areas have been successful in attracting, attracting collective wealth investment in the form of mobility resources? And which territories of Mexico Valley Metropolitan Zone have failed to attract a share of the city's collective wealth in the form of mobility resources? So to investigate uh, these mobility resources empirically, I'm proposing this theoretical framework in which I'm assessing um, the levels of rivalry and excludability of mobility resources. And by doing that, I'm able to classify mobility resources into four categories, right? Those mobility resources that are both excludable and rival um, well, they're the private mobility resources, right? The pet personal car, a driving license, a personal bicycle, having a passport, so forth. Um, those mobility resources that are non-excludable and non-rival, I'm calling these the public mobility resources, um, like sidewalks, free public transit systems, assuming that there's enough seats, the street lights, or, 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 or uh, paved roads, right? Mobility resources that are excludable but non-rival, I'm calling these tall mobility resources, like parking spaces, right? Um, if there's a toll to park your car, private bike sharing programs, concession transit systems. And finally, the mobility resources that are non-excludable but are rival, I'm, com I'm calling these the common mobility resources like parking spaces, assuming that they're free, right? They're rival, they're, they're going to be depleted. Um, a public bike sharing program um, or public transit systems, um, assuming that the ferry is very low and, uh, but the seats are going to be depleted. Now, um, of course, I, I go into more detail of this theoretical framework in the paper, but there's a couple of important um, things to think about in this theoretical framework. One of them is congestion. And the other one is um, the price relative to income of people. So if there's congestion, a mobility resource could um, shift from being a public mobility resource to a common mobility resource, right? Um, and when the fare to use a transit system is high relative to income of people, then it becomes excludable, right? If the fare is very low or close to negligible, uh, relative to the income of people, then it becomes uh, non-excludable. So with this theoretical framework, what I'm doing is um, mapping public and common mobility resources. So I'm doing compound indicators uh, to measure each of these mobility resources um, in the range between zero and one, right? So mo public mobility resources, I take data from the National Housing Inventory uh, uh, developed by the Mexican National um, Statistics Institute. And I measure the provision of sidewalks, streetlights, and paved roads um, in the metropolitan zone. And then for the common mobility resources, um, I'm mapping um, the mobility resources that are publicly owned or highly um, subsidized by the state so that they become non-excludable. Non um, and um, I'm looking at subways and rail systems publicly owned bus companies and bus rapid transit, right? Now, to answer the question of the extent to which investment in public and common mobility resources is being directed towards central marketplaces um, or concentrated in, um, in space, in central market places, I'm identifying employment subcenters in Mexico City. 
So I'm following a methodology that I've done in other papers. I'm doing an analysis of employment magnitude and density as originally proposed by Giuliano and Small, right? So those are the methods that I am following. And these are the results. Um, this is a map of public mobility resources. So, you know, Mexico City is a metropolitan zone of 20 million people um, that spreads over 220,000 hectares and uh, over three states, right? So it's very big. Um, and um, as you can see in this map, um, the, this navy blue color um, is the territory with high provision of public mobility resources uh, and the orange and red colors have the lowest provision of public mobility resources. So as you can see, there's a concentric pattern here, right? Where the inner city is well provided of public mobility resources. Remember that I'm measuring here sidewalks, the street lights, and paved roads, right? But the peripheral areas um, are not as well provided of public mobility resources. Now, this is um, the map for common mobility resources. Remember that I am measuring uh, publicly owned transit systems or privately owned transit systems that are heavily subsidized by the state, right? Uh, and the tariff is close to negligible. Um, the landscape is, it is very different. Um, the area here in this light yellow has absolutely no provision of common mobility resources, right? And uh, the red area is low provision of common mobility resources and only the blue and light and navy blue areas have um, high or medium high provision of common mobility resources. And again, you can see that it's um, concentrating in the inner city with the exception of this area here, right? But this is important that almost 70% of the area of the metropolitan region has absolutely no common mobility resources. Um, and finally, um, I'm also looking at, at the distribution of these public and common mobility resources, right? And I created four categories according to um, whether uh, the territory has a provision that is above the mean in each of these mobility resources that I'm analyzing, right? So for instance, this area that has the navy blue color is above in both mobility resources, right? Um, and the area in yellow is below the average in both mobility resources. This area in light blue is above the average only in public mobility resources, but not in common mobility resources. And I'm, I'm overlapping to this map, the employment subcenters, this um, area here with this pattern that you can see in this map, um, those are the employment subcenters in Mexico City. So my conclusions is that there's three kinds of territories here that I'm uh, kind of identifying. The first kind of territory is here in the inner city where um, most of the territory with good provision of public and common mobility resources, the navy blue area, is by and large overlapping with uh, most of the employment subcenters in the metropolitan region, right? But also a second kind of territory are um, areas with good provision of common mobility, public and common mobility resources, but away from employment subcenters, like this area here and this area here, right? And then there's a third kind of area, um, employment subcenters that have a very poor provision of common mobility resources below the average uh, of the metropolitan region. So these are central marketplaces, right? Employment subcenters that are failing to attract um, an important share of the wealth that is produced by the city. So what are the implications for um, urban policy of this study? I, I will highlight at least um, two of them. The first one is that with this map, um, we can have a clear idea of the territories that are lacking um, an adequate investment in public and common mobility resources. And then it can, it can become um, a blueprint for policy and go to these territories and provide um, better levels of mobility resources. 
And the second contribution is that um, this methodology can be a new tool for scholars and for activists to engage in the politics of commoning mobility resources, right? So maybe this met methodology can be replicated for other uh, urban areas and it becomes a tool for the politics of commoning mobility resources. Um, with that, I finish and thank you so much for your um, attention. Thank you, David, that was right on time. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Gargi and Rutul from SEPT University to uh, go ahead and present the paper now. Thank you. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Hello, is my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. You're visible. So good afternoon once again, everyone. Uh, I'm Gargi Mishra and I'm a PhD student at SEPT University. Uh, and I'll be presenting my study on ecological perspectives and spatial planning, uh, critical reviews of master plans for Delhi. So this is a review based study, which is an uh, which is one of the outcomes of the literature review that I've, I'm currently carrying out for my uh, PhD work. And this study was guided uh, by Dr. Rutul Joshi. And unfortunately today he'll uh, not be able to uh, make it to this discussion, but I'll be presenting on his behalf as well. So just a quick background here. Uh, my larger PhD uh, topic uh, is on spatial ecological water sensitive planning. So here in the, this study, I uh, sort of uh, uh, dug deeper into the ecology and spatial planning aspects through the literature review and taking the uh, case of uh, planning tools such as master plans uh, taking the case of Indian city of Delhi, and then I present, I'll be presenting my uh, findings from this. So this will be the outline of today's presentation. I'll be briefly presenting the background, the positionality or the entry point of this research, uh, the key concepts which include uh, spatial planning, the implications of ecology and spa uh, on spatial planning, the uh, relevance of ecosystem services into it, the main research method that we had adopted, uh, learnings from the critical review of uh, master plans for Delhi. So here I'll be considering three first three master plans, which I'll be discussing shortly. And finally, the key discussion points, since it's an ongoing research, so the discussions would continue. So let's talk about the uh, main uh, driver of various positive and negative changes that cities are facing today, which is the urbanization. Urbanization causes uh, uh, results in the dynamic socioeconomic trends, complexities, and the dynamic physical uh, concentration of settlements within the cities, which leads to a larger discourse on land development versus environmental conservation. Uh, the conservationist perspective argues that uh, uh, due to the uh, haphazard development, unfettered uh, uh, development, and unplanned uh, uh, built development again. Uh, it is causing uh, exploitation of natural resources, um, disrupting the balance of ecology. And when this is accompanied by cross-sectoral issues such as climate change, the conditions get even worse. So overall, these set of issues are questioning the entire notion of sustainability today for us, uh, which aims to ideally uh, integrate economic, ecological, as well as social benefits through land development. However, the dilemma has been uh, uh, continued uh, since decades now, and it is still going on, and the discourse continues. So this study would like to contribute to this larger discourse, which is on land development versus environmental conservation through uh, through our lens, which is on uh, spatial planning and ecology. So uh, with, with this background, we want to, uh, the, the perspective that we'll be following overlays spatial planning and ecology together. So we argue that there are nuances between spatial planning and ecology, and these are two interconnected uh, domains, which should not be uh, worked in silos and must integrate together for uh, for the uh, for the sustainability uh, aspect which we all desire today so ecology uh, prioritizes spatial scales above any urban or rigid uh, urban or rural rigid remits or boundaries of the city so one could argue that why spatial planning and not urban or rural or regional planning so here we want to highlight that uh, these ecosystems or uh, eco ecosystem services they do not have fixed boundaries. 
they expand beyond any urban uh, 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 urban city uh, boundaries. So for example, boundaries of watersheds, catchments, forestry, etc. They all expand uh, beyond it and they need governance plans which are not limited to uh, uh, a strict boundaries here. Uh, another thing is the, uh, the spatial planning and uh, ecology. So spatial ecological planning, if I term it here, includes two key components, which are ecosystems and its services. And this will be the uh, main uh, component which we'll be assessing for, the, for Delhi shortly here. Uh, also, lastly, the environmental sensitive development or eco development, which is a component of sustainable development here, uh, it cannot go against silo uh, and it has to work in harmony with spatial planning. Hence, the two are uh, strongly interconnected with each other. So uh, uh, the, the, the method that we followed for this uh, research was, uh, since it's a review-based research, so it was largely based on uh, literature review of theoretical concepts, paradigms around spatial planning, ecology, ecosystem services, and disservices together. Uh, based on the uh, review, we identified our assessment framework which is the Millennium Assessment Framework, which I'll be discussing in the next slide. Um, so we have used this kind, this framework for assessing the spatial planning tools, taking the case study of uh, Delhi. Uh, based on the learnings of this case study, we want to close the loop and we want to present our results, which theoretically assess the inclinations of spatial plans towards the ecology in context of Indian cities, uh, which is presented by uh, Delhi. So for the, the, based on the literature review, we derived our key uh, concept, which states that uh, planning approaches such as land development tools uh, should preserve and foster the delicate relationship between humans and their built in natural environment, which is essentially the ecological component. This is done by either providing or regulating the necessary ecosystem services. So what are these ecosystem services? Uh, it, uh, the eco these ecosystem services are majorly classified into four uh, aspects, four categories. Uh, first is the provisioning services, which means uh, the benefits that we get from the ecosystems directly in terms of food, fresh water, etc. Second is the regulating services, that is benefits we obtain by regulating certain ecosystem processes, such as flood regulation, water purification, treatment, climate regulation, etc. Third is the cultural ecosystem services, which are the intangible or non-material benefits that we get from the ecosystem services. And fourth are the supporting ones that uh, support these three uh, uh, services. So the Millennium Assessment Framework, which was uh, which was produced in 2003, it argues that uh, it advocates that uh, these four types of ecosystem services uh, are the drivers for uh, well-being of a place. So well-being, as it was discussed in the first uh, presentation today, uh, it comprises of various uh, aspects, and we are entering uh, through the perspective of environment and ecology here. So moving on to the uh, findings we got from the uh, review of master plans for Delhi. So we are here, we have considered the three master plans. First was uh, the one in 1962, second was in 2000, second was uh, uh, produced in 1991 uh, with the perspective of 2001, and the third was perspective 2021. So th the first master plan, so firstly, why Delhi uh, here? So we took the case study of Delhi because uh, post-independence, uh, it was the first statutory plan that came up and it was discussed widely, discussed widely. And uh, the whole idea of planning this uh, capital city was about uh, uh, making a place that is suitable for this large influx of migrants and refugees in the city. It had uh, the various uh, considerations in it, which I'll be talking about uh, in the next slide. However, the, so the first statutory master plan was Delhi and we found it a, a very uh, significant stepping stone in this uh, history of contemporary India. So the second uh, master plan uh, was prepared in 1991. So you can see that the, between the first and second master plan, there was this gap, which was caused because of Asia games. And uh, this, was a, uh, this gap caused another set of issues in the city which were uh, related to this unplanned urbanization and sprawl that happened which was not guided by uh, a statutory framework since the first master plan had envisioned only till 1981. So nevertheless, the second master plan here, for the first time it explicitly focused on maintaining ecological balance of the region. So uh, this was done through circulation network and extensive lung spaces as it was quoted in the plan. 
The third plan, which was prepared in 2005, approved, approved in uh, 2007, uh, again, it, it involved multiple agencies, but primarily it was the DDA, Delhi Development Authority, that was involved. It also attempted to prioritize environment conservation and sustainable development in its vision. It uh, the, the key reason here was uh, Delhi started facing issues related to air pollution, water pollution, noise, land pollution, etc. And because of this need or the crisis that the city was facing in terms of environment, they uh, explicitly mentioned the uh, ecological uh, consideration or prioritize environment conservation uh, in its objectives and also in its uh, vision. So we'll be, we have assessed these uh, master plans on the basis of four services, as I mentioned, since we had used the MA framework. So in terms of provisioning services, the first master plan uh, talked about a few things, only a limited extent. So the first thing, for example, for in terms of getting food or trade or poultry, so they had a proposed a concept of urban villages. So these urban villages had few uh, restrictions and they were specifically made for uh, production and trade of food poultry. In, it, in terms of water uh, provisioning services, it had, uh, it had considerations for water supply, which was through both surface and groundwater resource and, and as suggested to make a piped water network for supplying water into the city. In terms of uh, regulatory services, it only had um, consideration of few utilities, which was again, water supply, sewage and solid waste management. So in terms of solid waste management, they had only uh, quoted dumping grounds and sanitary filling. So uh, in uh, it, it, was, uh, it was just quoted that way, although um, uh, the details of the plans were then, um, the details of uh, these types of services, they have suggested that would be uh, further uh, made by the water supply department of the municipal corporation. So the plan only recommended that uh, these services should be provided. Uh, secondly, there was no consideration about um, stormwater management or drainage. So in terms of regulatory services, there was only the utilities that was involved. For the cultural services, which are these intangible uh, so uh, benefits, uh, there was mention of only recreational services in terms of district parks, local parks and playgrounds. Uh, here, uh, the uh, idea was to only to get recreational benefits and not uh, uh, beyond that. So uh, lastly, in terms of supporting, supporting services, uh, which talked about much larger uh, components uh, there was only a very limited consideration and the plan had talked about green belt, which was to regulate uh, urban development. However, the green belt later did not serve its purpose completely what it was uh, supposed to serve. And uh, uh, there were a lot of amendments in the plan later, but at least in the first master plan, the, the uh, provision of uh, supporting services was uh, indirectly mentioned. In the second master plan, which was prepared in again 1991, uh, the provisioning services in terms of water talked about water supply infrastructure or just the augmentation. The regulatory services here increased. So now the plan uh, 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 talked about stormwater management for the first time. It also talked about channelization of Yamuna River, which was not mentioned earlier. It talked about a treatment of effluent because of increasing industrial uh, wastes, increasing industrial uh, liquid waste or effluent, which we commonly call. So uh, uh, inclusion of that, and then again, augmentation of sewage network for improving sanitation in the city, uh, solid waste management by prepare, by proposing seven new sanitary landfill sites. So like regulatory services then increased in the second master plan. Uh, for the cultural services, the, OE, the goal was now beyond the recreation. So they wanted to, in the, the plan had aimed uh, had aimed to increase uh, uh, recreational spaces for educational purposes, for aesthetic purposes. So this uh, again expanded in the second master plan. Uh, in terms of supporting services, there was, I could find uh, 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 aspects such as emphasis on uh, preserving the ridge, which was a uh, uh, bridge through plantation of indigenous species and trees for so soil and nutrient formation. So this was again a new input in the plan. The third uh, master plan, uh, which was prepared in 2005, a perspective 2021, uh, into, again, uh, ex expanded the provisioning services. 
much expanded the regulatory services as for the first time it talked about both hard and soft interventions that recommended water conservation and they were beyond uh, uh, just the infrastructure solutions for the city they also talked about integration of water sewage drainage systems and they also uh, talked about various new concepts that are now uh, in uh, in debates and mostly in the uh, developed parts of the world which are now being considered there such as uh, your blue green infrastructure integrated water management rainwater harvesting etc so there was also a component of involving communities to regulate the issues of floods and etc so this was a, a sort of a step ahead and uh, this was a development in the planning process uh, similarly, cultural ecosystem services again expanded. There was now mention of uh, 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 green spaces and recreational spaces at both micro level and macro level in detail, and the classification was uh, made in, in a much detailed manner this time. Uh, for the, uh, reg the supporting services for these three ones, the emphasis on water cycle was made on dif at different scales through these hard and soft uh, interventions, which I just talked about in terms of regulatory ecosystem services. So if we compare the three now, uh, there was a huge development from 1962 to 2021 in terms of these four types of ecosystem services. While 1962 plan had only the minimal uh, uh, components in it, the 2021 plan expanded and considered uh, um, multiple inputs from it. So what we learn from uh, uh, this is that the, while in principle, the plan had increasing considerations of ecology and ecosystem services, the on ground translation has been the real challenge. So master plans for Delhi have already been uh, criticized for its uh, governance and implementation uh, processes. However, this the implementation and assessment of governance is beyond the scope of this research, but we figured that uh, just in uh, just the state uh, putting the survey considerations in in the plan is not enough and we need to go beyond the plan making process and actually make uh, the governance implementation uh, frameworks to efficiently implement what is there in the plan so the case of delhi is also representative of a uh, majority of fast growing indian cities today which are uh, dependent on statutory plans however they are growing first and the plans are implemented later. So there's a, this disbalance that the cities are growing fast and they're relying on slow implementation of the strategies. Hence, the, lastly, to conclude, the dilemma of land development and environment conser con uh, conservation, which I talked about earlier, it requires not just the integration of ecological perspectives into the plans, but it also urgently requires efficient implementation of the framework in harmony with the governance and implementation participation, etc for the overall goal of uh, ecologically sensitive development and sustainability. So uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, uh, the, this larger PhD is a part of uh, Water for Change project, which is a collaboration uh, between the DST, Government of India, and NW Netherlands. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, we'd like to uh, thank them for the opportunity and open to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gargi. Uh, before I move on, I'd like to request uh, the audience to start putting in your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, I, I'd like to ask Amish to go ahead and present his book. Oh, great. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Thank you for organizing this and giving me an opportunity to present. Uh, I'm Amish and the work I'm presenting today is Missing in Action in Search of an Integrated and Pragmatic Planning Information Framework in India. Uh, this is part of my PhD at the University of Manchester where I look at the interplay of planning information in practice based on the case study of Mumbai. So before I start, uh, I would just like to say that I'll first talk about the context and the need to develop a planning information framework. And then I'll swiftly move on to presenting as to how planning information actually uh, operates in practice. So, uh, once again, before we start, let me just clarify that I use the terms planning information and data interchangeably well aware of the differences. Simply put, actually information is just uh, much more meaningful uh, than data. 
but by planning information i refer to the information that is actually used in decision making and i uh, avoid using the word evidence uh, because of its high level sophisticated characteristics so let me just start with a story uh, and an incident that was narrated to me by a senior planner in the uh, corporation uh, in the greater mumbai corporation so he he told and i quote i freshly graduated and joined the development planning department uh, we worked very hard on the draft tp and were very close to submitting it to the state government for approval but then the center passed the coastal regulations zone act of 1991 and sagri mehnat paanyat gele literally which actually means everything went down the drain what this indicates is the multiscalar nature of planning in india and how chaotic it actually is chaos uh, in planning is understood as uh, something that is incomprehensible and as hillier has un- uh, understood it it's, it's it's relation to randomness chance and incomprehensibility in this case as i argue that it emerges from a range of paradoxical factors that are present within the planning system in india uh, namely top down technocratic and bottom up participatory as well as an elite driven multi actor planning system and the final point uh, is information asymmetry and this is something i would like to elaborate a little bit on mm, but before we move on to information asymmetry uh just look just have a quick look at the figure on the right and it can give you an indication as to the amount of uh urban local bodies that are present in the indian planning system and just the sheer scale is uh, massive so moving on a compulsory footnote in in most of the urban study scholarship in india as you all might have read is to underline the dire state of urban data and especially information that is used for granular analysis so nayar uh, in her seminal study on bangalore remarked that there may be no accurate cartographic representation of the actual extent of the urban territory and this is a large and a huge claim right uh, bangalore being one of the uh, biggest cities in india as well but contradictory to this the amount of information that is used in local plans and policies highlights the real value of india's spatial data infrastructure the problem arises because these the information that is used in plans and policies is disbursed by the central government or central planning agencies and just have a look at the mismatch between the governance structure and the census geographies there is a huge mismatch between uh, how urban local bodies operate at what scale they operate the jurisdictional issues and the actual census geographies that are there and this creates the problem of how information actually plays out in its practical realities and this is this is where i start from so how do we then plan for plan and take effective decisions using uh, information that is going to tell us more about our cities so a, a suggestion that has been there for some time is uh, urban information systems which respond to fluid dynamic and fuzzy context and they involve a range of urban themes so urban information systems are envisioned and designed to mediate diverse types of urban data for producing knowledge and improving decision making in spatial planning with advances in uh, geospatial technology especially given the past two decades with and the pace with which geospatial technology has advanced there is a renewed interest in building urban information system and within the indian context as well uh, if you look at it the planning commission the eighth plan suggested that urban information systems be created uh this was also su- suggested by the national commission on urbanization and more recently there was a report that sank without a trace which was the national urban policy framework uh and that too suggested that there should be urban information systems that should be built but the, but when we are thinking about something as sophisticated as urban information systems let's just also pause and think that 
all more than 60% of our cities do not even have a proper functioning master plan uh, that is actionable right so let's pause and look back as to what sort of framework can we use if we have to build something like an urban information system in the future so when i zoom out and go into the uh, literature bits of it this is rooted in uh, the culture of evidence based planning and spatial information systems which uh, derive their uh, with which, which derive from the systems and data informed planning uh, theory approaches uh, which are and uh, the the second strand of literature that is there in the literature is the critical plan theory or what you uh, also call the communicative planning theory then the there is this emerging global south scholarship and the final one is agonistic communication and i'll come to agonistic communication uh, uh, soon but before that uh, i would just like to say that even though the systems and data informed planning theory is uh, very useful uh, in providing technocratic solutions their relation to how they actually operate in action uh, is limited whereas communicative planning theory is very idealistic in its approach in promoting a lot of communication uh, within the planning process but again uh, how it pans out in practice uh, has that th there have been lots of debates about it the global south scholarship offers a very uh, good and interesting substantive content of uh, what sort of themes can be taken into planning but since this scholarship is still emerging uh, the practice based approaches of this are still uh, under development so what i then turn to is agonistic communication agonism means um, polemic and in agonistic communication what you argue for is that all types of consensus are highly valued and there is no need to re reach a particular consensus and there is equal information sharing and communication between all the stakeholders that are involved and this has been applied to planning theory recently i'll not delve deeper into the literature but you can ask me questions about it later so based on this and the context in india i developed a conceptual uh, approach uh, to look at this and i developed three major uh, themes uh, three fundamental concepts one is planning information in which i uh, i uh, i argue that we need small area information they have to be critically uh, they have to be related to the critical planning issues because at the end of the day that is what planners are most concerned of and they are not going to use information that uh, that talk about policies that they won't be able to implement finally it's the users uh, that are important and uh, the third is any system or any sort of framework that has been designed should be interrelated in its uh, power relations and if we don't factor for that then uh, it's bound to fail in reality and in practice right so uh, based on this i developed this uh, framework and then i operationalized it using a range of different sorts of techniques like geo visualization elite interviews i conducted a work i conducted two three workshops actually one with ihs as well and uh, i i chose mumbai as the case study for a number for reasons but primarily because it's one of the only districts in india that is 100% urban and you can see in the map that uh, it, it is quite it was also a very physically constrained city but still uh, i chose that because it was go undergoing the development planning process at the at that time now i'm going to quickly go through this uh, section because uh, this forms a part of my other larger work in the phd but um, it, it's it's important to give the context of what is the current planning information in use and it we it is rooted in the demographic and the socio economic paradigm and we do not move beyond housing commuting and environment and even when we do move beyond these three themes there is an over reliance on central data collection agencies and let me just show you with the with this example of um, two maps of population decline given by the census uh, the data is based on the census data and if you look at the left map the, that map is wrong because uh, of a simple reason that the two wards in the north 
underwent massive restructuring between 1991 and 2011 so they were clubbed uh, they they were separated and then clubbed and because of but the census did not account for that it did account for it in uh, in a very different manner so the, if you're using the census data directly you're not going to come up with these small small uh, trends that small area data and information try to portray so this over reliance on central data collection agency agencies is uh, is a bit problematic finally we are still using a lot of traditional information and there is still no innovation in terms of what sort of uh, information that can be used and there's a lot of uh, upcoming uh, debates about open data and satellite data and everything i won't dwell too much into it and the understanding is that our small area information and data is very poor but is it really very poor so uh, this is uh, th this is something that uh, i look at in another aspect of my work but before uh, now let's look at how it operates in practice and why is it so hard to uh, make sense of the information landscape uh, at the local level so just have a look at the number of sections in which the city has been segmented into there are electoral wards planning sectors ready reckoner zones census has its own different sections there are special planning agencies wards zones so there's it's it's quite chaotic and quite fragmented for anyone to quickly make sense of it right then there is a mismatch between admin geographies and census geographies which also results in um, different sorts of problems and finally the governance bit when we look at the governance bit uh, we, we can see that there is there is a huge sort of uh, balkanization of planning and ba by balkanization there is this there are like a number of small small agencies uh, planning and having uh, their say on how the city is conceived in fact uh, in the development plan for uh, 2034 it was reported that 30% of mumbai's land was not even considered for a simple reason it fell under the mumbai port land and also uh, when i spoke to a planner at the local level he told me that only they have only 5% land on which they can plan for so that land issue is also there so we need to be able to visualize space to plan for it um yeah so when when i went to when i went and uh, sought stakeholder perspective uh, there were a few key themes that emerged and one is that uh, there's a huge reliance on uh, local data for a simple reason that people are very uh, wary of going to other departments and other and uh, of the top down sort of uh, order that has been uh, that is pushed on them so just a quote from one of the planners which says they decide planning information and target indicators based in delhi for the entire country we are wrong about some of the slum information here so many times and it is our team only that collects this data but those sitting in delhi have next level confidence so they are not very uh, sure of the data or the indicators that come from uh, the central data collection agency when i also asked uh, i presented a very unique sort of data set that i collected for my phd which was about the commuting data and i presented that to an a, a senior official at the mumbai metro rail corporation and um, they responded saying when you talk about this information from Ra railway ministry it is useless i'm not going to go begging to the central government every time i need commuter data for kolaba take the example of uh, the ra metro controversy we were not sure about one land parcel and one of the biggest reasons we did not go down another route was because uh, we did not want to keep moving from pillar to post in bombay high court and delhi so they, are, they they would rather deal with the issues locally instead of uh, and this is something this what i'm talking about is not anything new we all know about the top down bottom up uh, churning that happens in the planning system but that has an effect on the planning information and that is something that we need to uh, think about finally uh, about capacities so what emerged from my uh, interviews and workshops was that 
when we talk about capacities we are not talking about technical capacities because we have them and there are numerous examples to show that but there is a clear lack of leadership that is existing when it comes to using the sort of information that is actually needed to make effective decisions in the cities and this is this is this is a point that a lot of uh, my participants raised constantly uh regarding capacities and culture of uh, planning but i won't dwell much into the culture finally i want to come down to one more most important theme that emerged out of my interviews was how planners are viewed and how they view themselves and this is this is a very important uh, bit especially uh, the quote on firefighting where almost most of my participants uh, mentioned that we are just firefighting we have substituted everything to the consultant and the consultant is temporary so one of the planning uh, officials actually regarded that there is no planning in india and we are just moving from jugad 1.0 to jugad 4.0 uh, the other someone else told me that we do not have enough uh, time to look at anything like planners do not have enough time to look at innovative sorts of information or even evidence or is it even meaningful analysis someone also a very harsh statement but someone reacted with saying ulbs were pwd departments until the jnn urm and this again uh, relates to the point on capacities uh, so there there has to be this clear sort of understanding and also a push from some higher authority about why this is needed finally uh, how planners view themselves this is the last quote i would be sharing and we'll come to the conclusion bit so this this when i showed my so i built a demonstrative uh, information tool to show uh, all the planners and this is what the planners first reaction was mumbai is planned till 2034 this planning information is great and we will need it then but right now our job is finished in 2016 so this this speaks as to how they view their uh, how they view planning uh, and how it is viewed uh, in their own eyes finally this what what i'm trying to uh, come to and these are this is still in development is how do we view planning information how can we revisit planning education and uh, can we re empower the planners taking care of the power relations or uh yeah and so zooming out and going back to where i started was about planning practice and when we are going to go for urban imaginaries in the future and we are going to imagine our cities in a different way and especially with covid-19 coming i think it is uh, important that we stop and ask what sorts of methods and ideals can we have to uh, inform our cities better so that we can plan for them better thank you thank you amish um i would like to request the audience to put down some questions um in the meanwhile i'd just like to take a couple of minutes to reflect on what we've heard till now uh it's very interesting i mean all planning sessions sort of have this uh this you know uh, relationship between what is planned and what is implemented right like i'm i'm thinking about uh, a quote from uh, gautam bhan's paper um, about how like what is on the plan is not on the ground and what is on the ground is not really on the plan and this becomes like the biggest problem of the way in which uh, you know planning is conceived um, especially like you know uh, uh, there were two papers that kind of spoke about how uh, you know there is a lot in planning but implementation is a problem because plan is the kind of realm of aspiration and it can get idealistic but you know there there's always a uh, implementation becomes a realm of politics uh, and uh, I, 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 and that's where the problems actually start occurring um i'd actually like to start with uh, you know gargi's paper and david's paper and and i was thinking about like you all spoke gargi you spoke about how you know uh different plans in uh, delhi uh, started to include you know uh, the the ecology and the environment uh, over time uh, and you see and you see an increase in that and and i was wondering like if you could speak to what are the 
you know political movements or what are the kinds of actions uh, that led to those uh, happening you know like like what is it that actually led to those aspirations emerge within your plans uh, similarly i was thinking about uh, your paper david uh, you know you also speak about how there is this high density of mobility within mexico city center and, and the peripheries don't have it and what is it that uh, led, what is it that led to that i was uh, uh, i was also sort of like you know thinking about like what do you say to people um, who kind of support the density of public net, public you know uh, commuting within city centers and not on the peripheries because i think that it gives rise to spoils or it gives rise to you know um uh, like like they think that the city is much more efficient you know the more the services are concentrated in the center and and i was wondering what your uh, reactions to that are especially given that you're saying that employment centers are coming to the outskirts i mean are these walkable uh, employment centers and that's why there is no sort of you know mobility there I, i'm just curious about that um i'll i i like to start with that and i'll wait for the questions to pour in so um i'll start uh, thank you namrata for that that's actually a very uh, important reflection which you just mentioned because it was uh, when i while i was reviewing literature and i was reading uh, critical reviews of master plans of delhi which has already been uh, done by various authors most of the criticisms were in terms of over ambitiousness of the plan they have criticized the plans in terms of implementation and the barriers that were occurring in for implementing the plans uh, there were also uh, i was trying to chronologically map certain events that uh, that created uh, the necessity to in include in environmental considerations in the plan for example in 1987 85 uh, when the environment act came out and the main reason for this was the increasing the rising rate of pollution in the city so that was one of the turning points when it became mandatory for the government to uh, to include environmental considerations and then in the 1990s when the whole agenda of sustainable uh, 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 sustainability and the development uh, came forward and that was another trigger for the plans to include that however despite in uh, considering these major aspects which were very relevant and very important the on ground translation has remained a problem for for governing the growth for managing the growth and also so hence it remains like a tokenism or a window dressing ritual that in in principle the plan has these a b see uh, criteria however it's it's the when when you talk about uh, implementation it beca- becomes a challenge and that is i think a, a good next step for the study to st- uh, to, uh, to reflect on that later okay. um yeah david you could go ahead david you have thank you thank you from david oh, thank well. you uh you have another question from devika as well but you could you could go ahead and All right. Um, thank you, Namrata, for for your question. It's very interesting. Um, so I, I'm not trying to answer these questions in the in this paper, but I do I do answer them in the dissertation, right? In, in the entire um, document. And um, in Mexico City, in in the metropolitan area, I, the explanation has to do with high political fragmentation and different. Um, traditions uh, and trajectories in providing public goods to the population and the political economy of transport um the central area of mexico city metropolitan metropolitan zone is um what we usually call um the federal district right um so it's its own political entity um and it has a strong tradition of providing public goods to the population whereas this area is surrounded by the peripheral area which is in a different state because mexico city is a tri-state area which is the state of mexico and the state of mexico does not have a tradition of providing public goods to the population and furthermore the political economy of public transport is operating to commodify public transport and extract wealth from the population that is created in their mobility needs right so within the same metropolitan area within the same functional urban area we have two very different traditions of providing public goods and commodifying public transport overlapping in the same city um and and that's why i i think we see these these huge differences no i see uh 
Devika has a question for you as well, which is, um, you mentioned the public system of common mobility resources. Uh, is there also a private system of mass mobility in Mexico City? And uh, are they more expensive? Uh, and uh, yeah. Just yeah. Um, oh yeah, public transit in Mexico City is very complex and um, many transit systems, most of the transit systems uh, in Mexico City are operating through a system of concessions. So they are privately owned and privately managed to provide the service of public transit. But in my methodology, I'm not measuring them, right? I'm not, I'm not mapping them because in my methodology, I, I, I classify them as toll mobility resources because people have to pay an important uh, amount of money to use them, right? So I'm only mapping the common mobility resources which are um, non-excludable. So systems that are um, privately owned or highly subsidized. But yeah, there's a lot of private systems providing public transit. Uh, Amish, Harry has a question for you. He says, based on great presentation and then based on your research, what do you think is a good way for creating accessible data, especially when you consider the conundrum of uh, error reliability of crowdsource or, or open source data um, and privacy protection of data from private data collection agencies. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a question around that as well, which is basically that, uh, you know, I, I was very interested in sort of when you said that there's an over-reliance on the centralization of data. Um, and especially because you speak of Bombay, Bombay has had a history of many, many community groups actually producing their own data. So if you uh, know of the Spark study, which collected, you know, uh, slum, uh, did a slum census and then uh, actually helped the government get that data later. Uh, but the thing is that uh, there would still be the necessity, you know, going back to uh, Hedy's question of, of centralizing this data somehow so that it's accessible to all, right? Like, so centralization plays its own role and decentralization plays its own role. And, and how do you see that getting bridged um, in some ways? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think uh, the key, like you mentioned, is to have a balance. But uh, right now, what is happening and uh, the civil society has amazing sorts of surveys. But my question is exactly that. The, why does the need arise? Uh, to for the civil society to step in and then uh, go and look at a lot of indicators at the local level. And that is because uh, there's this gap that is there uh, that has been created. And if you look at the census data, the economic census data, if you look at a lot of other sorts of data agencies, you will uh, realize that all of them collect data at the most disaggregated level. But uh, when they disperse it, they disperse it at the district level or something that is larger than that because of political reasons as well. And uh, because the district is what serves as the administrative region as well, right? So I think uh, the key is in uh, the answer to your question as well as David's is to create this sort of balance because uh, honestly, moving forward, I don't think any public agency or any civil society group will be able to deal with the amount of data that will be produced in the system and just the sure possibilities with crowdsource data and uh, tools, especially having phone in your hand are just massive. So I think the key is how we uh, balance this out and how we embed this within our decision-making environment. That is, that is the crucial aspect of it. Like uh, just the collection bit is just the first uh, part. So I think. Um... Krishi, you have a question as well, uh, which is basically how do you relate to the creation of green spaces and old heritage town? And is there any standard con uh, for consideration of the same? Um, I also had another question for you, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, I was thinking about your presentation. I was thinking about how uh, you speak about access across uh, the geography of Jaipur. And I was wondering, you know, usually uh, I come from Bombay and, and in Bombay, what happens is basically um, it is the poorer neighborhoods that have lower access to open spaces uh, and especially given you know the density of people is higher like the per capita availability of space kind of you know reduces and I was wondering if there is um, 
you know apart from the parks if there are other kinds of spaces which then get generated and become important for the well being of people in that scenario so uh, and and if you can talk to that um, you know anil and you have uh, have thought about this thing. yes definitely uh, so i would like to answer first your second question uh, for in cities like mumbai where there is very less scope of having urban green spaces particularly so what other spaces are there that could give us sense of well being that could be beneficial to mental health or social health so uh, sometime back i have done the studies and in mumbai itself it was on public spaces and the concept of public space because even the public spaces could impart a uh, similar benefit maybe not the environmental benefits but other mental health and spiritual uh, messages that i mentioned in my research so uh, the concept of public and open spaces will be very different in a city that may not be able to embrace completely its urban green space so for example in mumbai uh, in my perspective even the local train uh, even the transit route these can be public spaces because the uh, the time spent of any person in such city is maximum while traveling maximum in local and local are just not uh, for transit it it's more of a recreational experience because there are also sort of uh, activities there there are people selling things there are people talking over sometimes there are things happening social kind of things happening you can eat there you can buy stuff there so they sort of become public spaces in both sense so when there are uh, designated spaces absent then these uh, alternative spaces are to be considered to give these similar benefits of mental health and social purposes if that completely answers your question christy can you go ahead and answer that uh, first question which is very important yes yes that there is there is a zone or there is there any yes sir yes sir so uh, so uh, jaipur re- very recently became unesco world heritage site in january 2020 and this was certainly a question because jaipur is uh, one of the metro city that has very low kind of the lowest per capita urban green space distribution and the heritage precinct does not have have uh, the uh, urban green spaces at all so uh, and very recently in january also the wards has been redivided before uh, in 2014 there were 91 wards in jet in 2020 january they were divided into 250 wards 100 wards for heritage precinct and 150 wards for greater jaipur so those 100 wards are separately known as heritage precinct and they have been separately taken as heritage area only and not considered in the planning of the greater jaipur which is the reason uh, the region beyond uh, heritage precinct so yes heritage uh, is very crucial when uh, planning uh, urban green spaces so the heritage areas in a city has to be taken separately it cannot be clubbed with the planning of the rest of the city because the rest of the city is planned differently the committees have to be different the uh, policies have to be different for a heritage precinct other things have to be considered that is why a uh, heritage area in any city and specially since jaipur has already been titled as and recognized as a heritage world uh, united uh, U- unesco world heritage site so it has to be taken separately and policies are to be framed accordingly if i may add there is no standard as such uh, you know the planning the green but yes who has uh, Christy began with that there is a lack of three uh, meter square per person, whereas standard says nine square per meter square meter per person. So that gap emerges, which is like international standard, so to say, uh, which can be comparable with London and New York somewhere else. But in Indian context, in semi-arid region, particularly Jaipur, 
it is hard to create but but there is a scope also indian uh, standards are also there uh, you know uh, so therefore we need to bring in some parity and the distributional dimension is quite important where are those located the surplus which is much more and then where is the lack and heritage present as uh, uh, we are finding out here is completely absence of green spaces so the combinations you know it cannot be separate that the heritage you know it is a kind of a natural heritage the urban greens are natural heritage so so nuances has to link with this and if i can connect with uh, you know gargi's paper uh, look at the 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 consciousness of uh, greening and conservation has increased with the scarcity that 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 was faced by the delhiite during this period and the the pressure uh, uh, which is pollution pressure and you know the other uh, air pollution particularly so therefore it is important for a planner to to incorporate you know let's not go by standard but at least minimum level of you know quality green spaces uh, should be ensured and the the multi scalar plan is a established planning system in india and therefore we need to go down to neighborhood and then zonal and, and and city level so i think this connections is very important i really liked amis if i may extend this debate among ourselves amis you are fantastically you know you, you these are the everyday problem of planner you know we always see where to begin what is that territorialization that planning regime thinks of whereas the demo, you know the the other uh, uh, political and and governance boundaries are different and therefore the challenges lies here how do we naturally you know particularly use these tools planning tools to you know bring down the the information data available whether it is natural resource data or man made resource data or, or the human resource data and then combining it on the, on a spatial planning particularly a spatial planning and no of my friends who are practicing planner are always complaining oh i don't get data therefore they go into intuitive planning and therefore i think we should bring this discourse that there is an intuitive planning and all planner practitioner planners do that because somewhere you say okay enough is enough if there is lack of data no issue we'll still go ahead and plan if there's abundance of data we'll use it you know our convenience and then plan the data so i think within this paradox i think your 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 excellent job is done you know in terms of identifying those nuances and 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 capacity linked with that i really like that how do you relate this you know information and capacity together thanks a lot for bringing a nice presentations here yeah. yes thank you everyone thank we are out of time so we will end the session now but do uh, you know keep in touch and and you can uh, read the questions which are here thank you uh, amish and uh, Kargi for answering the questions uh, separately in the chat box. Thank you very much, and uh, have a nice weekend.